Hello, I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University. And on behalf of the Institute, I wanna welcome you out to our continuing series on the 2020 election. This will be our last event prior to election day, which of course is next Tuesday, and I encourage you to all go out and vote. But we'll be back again uh, on uh, November 10th with a post-election analysis panel. So I encourage you to look forward to that event. All of our events in this series uh, have been live streamed to our YouTube station. You can go there and find all of our previous events as taped events. And of course, you can see the upcoming events uh, live. I wanna thank the College of Arts and Sciences for their continued support of uh, the Foley Institute and their support of this particular series. If you'd like more information about this series or any of our events at the Foley Institute, I encourage you to like us on Facebook and you'll receive uh, information about our upcoming events. Or you can go to our website at foley.wsu.edu. So today's event will examine the role of the media in the campaign. From the days of Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats to the first televised debate between John Kennedy and Richard Nixon, to Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson's famous Daisy ad, to Russian manipulation of social media in 2016, the media has always played a critical role in electoral politics. Complaints about faults and negative advertising are perennial concerns, but now there are alarms about the outsized role of social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter as well. The media sphere is also more fragmented and polarized than ever. Followers of Fox News and conservative radio talk shows receive very different information and opinions than those following more mainstream sources like NBC or National Public Radio. Add to this a president who is often at war with the media, labeling critical reports as fake news, halting the practice of regular White House press conferences, belittling reporters, and calling the free press the enemy of the people. Trump is not the first president to feel aggrieved by the media coverage he receives, but he is certainly the most vocal in grumbling about his perception of media bias. All of this has made it more difficult for Americans to hold productive conversations across our political divides. So what is the role of the media in this election? How has polarization and fragmentation changed that role? Is there a media bias or simply a thin-skinned president? And what about the role of campaign advertising? So we have with us today two guests who are perfect to help us answer some of these questions. Travis Riddout is one of my colleagues here at Washington State University, where he serves as a Thomas S. Foley Distinguished Professor of Government and the Director of the School of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs. Travis is one of the country's leading authorities on political advertising and serves as co-director of the Wesleyan Media Project, which studies and tracks political advertising. He is the former chair of the political communication section of the American Political Science Association, and his research has been published in the leading journals of political science and mass communications. His most recent book, Political Advertising in the United States, was published by Rutledge Press in 2016. Kathleen Searles is an associate professor in the Manship School of Mass Communication and in the Department of Political Science at Louisiana State University. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Her interests include news media, campaign advertising and political psychology. Her research has also appeared in some of the leading journals of political science and mass communication. And she is also currently working on a book for Oxford University Press that investigates the effects of mobile devices on information processing. Kathleen is a founding member of the Women Also Know Stuff uh, group. It's an organization designed to amplify the voice of women political scientists in public discourse. And I'm proud to say that Katie is one uh, as an alum from our uh, political science program here at WSU, so it's great to see her back again. Professors Riddout and Searles are going to speak for about 30 minutes or so, and after that we'll have some time for discussion. If you have questions, I encourage you to send those to me uh, via email at tsfoley at wsu.edu. Again, that is TS as in Tom S. Foley at wsu.edu. So Travis and Katie, I'm going to turn the time over to you now, and I'll be back after with some questions from our audience. Well, thank you for that introduction, Cornell. I'm going to share my presentation with everyone now. 
And of course, we're talking about media coverage of presidential campaigns today. And here's what we're going to talk about. First, I'm going to go over some critiques of media coverage in 2016. I'm going to talk about what makes this 2020 election even more difficult for the news media to cover. And then Professor Searles is going to provide some recommendations for how news organizations should be covering this campaign, should be covering election day, and should be covering the aftermath of this election. So let me get started. One of the big critiques of the 2016 campaign coverage was that there was too much coverage focused on scandal. In fact, coverage focused on the, the so-called email scandal of Hillary Clinton. So if you look at this figure here, it's showing you the number of sentences in some mainstream news organizations, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, that focused on various issues. And so those dark blue bars are showing Clinton scandal issues. And the, that tallest bar there, that's discussion of Clinton's emails. Um, the second highest bar among the blue bars is discussion of the Clinton Foundation. And only then do we get to actual discussion of issues, jobs, immigration, trade, when it comes to Hillary Clinton. Now, if you look at uh, the red bars, that shows you coverage of Donald Trump. Those dark red bars are showing scandal coverage. So uh, scandals involving his taxes, uh, his treatment of women, Trump University, the Trump Foundation, Trump and Russia, all pretty low in volume when compared to the Clinton scandal coverage. Um, but in terms of issue coverage, uh, Trump got a lot more, but a lot of that was focused on immigration. And so one critique is there's just too much scandal coverage. Uh, here's a summary from a report that looked at this. It said, in just six days, the New York Times ran as many cover stories about Hillary Clinton's emails as they did about all policy issues combined in the 69 days leading up to the election. So this is the New York Times. This is not a supermarket tabloid. Um, they're focusing on scandal. They're, they're not focusing on issues. Another critique from 2016 was that there was just too much coverage of Donald Trump. So this chart here is showing you the percentage of coverage in um, from the middle of 2015 to the end of 2015. So really the, the Republican nomination campaign that is focused on each of the leading candidates. And you'll see that slightly more than a third of the coverage goes to Donald Trump, the guy who never held an elective office, the guy who and never run a political campaign. The guy who frankly was ill qualified to be president of the United States, yet he got more coverage than Jeb Bush or Senator Marco Rubio or Senator Ted Cruz or uh, Governor John Kasich. Um, and so a couple of quotes kind of illustrate this for us. I think uh, Margaret Sullivan is a media critic in the Washington Post. She wrote that they, the media, let Trump, the great distractor, hijack news coverage and play assignment editor. He became the shiny new toy that they couldn't take their eyes off. And then uh, here's Larry King critiquing his own network, CNN. He says, CNN helped make him Donald Trump by carrying every speech he made in the primary season. It was almost like the other guys didn't exist. And why did they carry every speech from Donald Trump live? Well, it got him good ratings. So those are a couple of the critiques. Another is just that the coverage was overall too negative. If you look at 
the general election coverage, 77% of the coverage of Donald Trump was negative. 64% of the coverage of Hillary Clinton was negative. Even during the, uh, if we add to that the primary campaigns, over half of the coverage of both those candidates was very negative. Um, and here's what I think is the most astounding. Again, we're looking at um, media coverage in mainstream news outlets. So 87% of the coverage for Trump's fitness in office was negative, which is sort of understandable in a way, given um, that he didn't have the political experience that one would need to be elected president of the United States. But if you look at Hillary Clinton's coverage, it was exactly the same. The former first lady, former senator, former secretary of state got the exact same coverage when it came to her fitness for holding office. And so the idea here is that the media were holding these candidates to different standards. I like this quote from an editorial page editor at the Sacramento Bee. He writes, Trump wasn't held to the same standard as a guy running for Lieutenant Governor of California. Um, another quote from this report I've talked about, because Trump entered the presidential stage from the world of business, hucksterism and reality TV, he was seen from the outset as a less serious contender. In fact, he was treated as a joke. And so the media didn't take seriously the idea that Trump could be elected president of the United States. Now, all of these critiques, um, they probably apply for 2020 as well. But we also have a new set of circumstances which makes it more difficult for the media to navigate their coverage in this year. Uh, one of those is a president who is trying to undermine confidence in the electoral system. Uh, we have voting during a global pandemic, which means that uh, elections officials have been scrambling to get up to speed, to figure out how they're going to process millions of more uh, mail-in ballots, for instance. And we're also living in an environment where there is a high threat of political violence. There's intense polarization in this country. Uh, the speed of social media uh, makes it possible for fast organizing. There's the spread of misinformation, both foreign and domestic, and then a president who in his speeches and in his Twitter feed incites violence. And so the media have a tough task at hand in covering this election, um, but my colleague Kathleen is going to provide some advice on how they should do that. Thank you, Travis. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you all. Here we go. Okay. So um, this group, uh, we're calling it the Election Coverage and Democracy Network, also ECAD. Um, uh, both Travis Erdow and I are signatories of this group, and it was motivated by a lot of the things Travis just discussed. Um, you know, political communication experts came together and said, we have a body of knowledge among us that could be helpful to journalists that are covering this really difficult election. Um, and, and so we came together as a group a um, couple of weeks ago. And what we produced is this website that you can visit there, mediafordemocracy.org, where we provide resources and also an expert list to journalists uh, that are covering this election with a real eye towards helping journalists, uh, knowing that there are constraints that they face and also knowing that these are very unusual circumstances for an election. Um, and the thrust of this work was a white paper which offered recommendations in three different areas. Uh, the first being how to cover the election, the second being how to cover the election in the event it's contested or one of the candidates does not concede, and the final being what to do if there is civil unrest, how to cover civil unrest. And so I want to talk a little bit about 
uh, some of the recommendations we make in those three areas. But first, I want to give a little bit of background of why this even matters. Um, and so, uh, you know, as this gift kind of uh, exemplifies, one of the things you may realize is that when you are watching news of all sorts, it's the tendency of the media to sort of make everything a, bit a game or sports, very often use the language of sports and war, um, even in the a case of a weather event, as this gift exemplifies. Um, and that is because the media has a certain set of incentives um, and to give the audience what they want. And uh, the data suggests that what the audience wants, what people watch, what people click is this sort of horse race coverage that makes everything seem like a game. And so that's how the news media covers elections. The problem with that is that this is often at odds with what we might want um, you know, to see for democratic coverage. Uh, this is not necessarily the sort of news that would help people make the, the sort of vote choices that they need to be able to make. And so knowing very much this is a conversation right now, and uh, especially since what happened in 2016, this group came together and wanted to really think about recommendations that could be made very much taking into context that journalists are motivated by profit, just like any other industry in this country. Um, they are mostly a private system uh, in, in the United States. And therefore we have to really be cognizant of what sort of incentives they might face and how that plays into the sort of coverage we see. And so, uh, this first area uh, is uh, just a set of recommendations around how to cover the election in the lead up to election day. And as Travis already talked about, one of those recommendations is very much how do we make sure that there is balance in the amount of coverage each candidate is getting. But the other thing that we really want to see is um, that the news media is centering voters in their coverage. Um, and why do we want to see this? Well, one of the things we're cognizant of is that horse race is entertaining. People really like to hear about who's up and who's behind in the polls. But another possible way uh, to cover the election that is also entertaining is to talk about voters, put voters at the center of the story. That's a great human interest story. Um, many of you may have seen the sort of clip that went viral of the voters dancing in line. Um, this is a feel good story that exemplifies everyday people engaging in civic duty. And it makes people the forefront of election stories rather than just the pawns in a the other thing we would like to see and that we're really encouraging uh, news media outlets to cover is poll workers. Poll workers like are also everyday people engaging in their civic duty. Um, they're often very well trained and they're there to make sure that people can vote safely. Um, and this is also a very feel good story about our democracy that should be at the forefront. Um, and the other kind of cautionary tale that we talk about in this, in this white paper that we really elevate is that it's really important for journalists and in fact all of us to remember that the sort of voices that we hear in the news media over and over again, and in fact the sort of voices that we all hear in our, our own networks, um, particularly if you're watching something like this, you're probably uh, in this category, are going to be the most politically engaged, the kind of people that are interested in politics, the kind of people that watch the news, and we should all remember journalists included, that lots of people, in fact, most Americans are not like that. They are not that engaged. Um, and we can talk more in the Q&A about why that is or what that means, but it's important to remember that when we are looking to the people that care about politics, that they're not necessarily representative of all of the United States. And that when we cover elections, that we should try or be cognizant of whose voices are included. And that's part of why we see this sort of uh, genre of story that uh, people kind of like to make fun of, which is like the voters and the diner story, right? It's as if you can only be a voter if you hang out in a diner. Um, and this is sort of a tendency of journalists to go look for normal people and where they end up as diners. I don't have diners in Baton Rouge. I don't know how many of you hang out in diners, but not all voters hang out in diners. So it's sort of a, a satirical example of, of what we see when we see journalist patterns return to the same sort of voices uh, and what that might mean for how representative coverage is. The other thing we really elevate in this white paper is um, for news media to not amplify unfounded claims. And this is really difficult for news media, in fact, for all of us, because we are trained as human beings, but also journalists are trained to really look for what we can call novelty. Novelty is something that really drives journalistic coverage. Um, and it, it, because of this sort of incentive to cover things that are novel, oftentimes we have journalists covering everything that turns up 
uh, whether it's a tweet or, uh, you know, sort of a outlandish statement, even if that perhaps the content of that statement is not democracy worthy, is not the sort of coverage that helps people make voting decisions. And so one of the things we're really emphasizing is that journalists should be more thoughtful about chasing novelty. Um, and indeed, this is very hard because typically uh, whatever the president says is novel, um, it's considered novel and it should be covered. But we have sort of a different set of circumstances. We have an extraordinary um, uh, sort of news media environment in which it's very cheap to produce content in which the president tweets constantly um, and is sort of engaging and talking to the public constantly. And so reconsidering what indeed is worthy of, of coverage, what is indeed novel is important because otherwise you're potentially amplifying every single claim. And that can be problematic Here's the sort of, you know, jokey way in which that can be problematic. We have articles on uh, whether or not wind does indeed kill birds, which is probably not deserving of coverage, um, but maybe gets a good laugh. But or the more serious unfounded claims that we should avoid sort of amplifying are claims about the veracity of processes, particularly in regards to election administration. We've seen a lot of this around um, concerns about mail and ballots coming from the president. We know that anytime a, the news is covering a statement like this, um, that it's amplifying that statement, uh, not only does that take attention and resources from coverage, which may actually be really useful to people making decisions and heading to the ballot box, but it also means that it's adding credibility to statements that may not be credible. The other thing we're thinking a lot about is what to do in the case of a contested election. And one of those recommendations we make is to really elevate election administrators and electoral processes and institutions. And it's generally not considered sexy to report on institutions. It's not sort of the clickbait worthy items you typically see. But right now it's more important than ever that we kind of talk about those unsexy things because it goes to the very heart of um, the democratic process and the safety of the democratic process. And so here we see an example of how actually drop boxes work, which is something that we're thinking a lot more about in this election. The other thing to, that um, is part of this and, and part of demystifying the institutions around electoral administration is to really emphasize that counting votes takes a long time and it always does and it probably really will this year. Um, and so that's one of the things we're also encouraging both the public and journalists to think about. Um, the other thing that we're encouraging news media to be really forthright with is um, how they're going to make decisions on election night. Because this election looks very different from elections in the past, uh, we really want to consider uh, how those decisions are being made in the news media we watch um, and, and the transparency around those decisions because projections might look very different this year. Um, and so that sometimes means that you're kind of meeting the quote unquote dorks behind the scenes. But one of the things that's great about that is that it really um, you know, takes back the curtain behind the process. It takes people behind the scenes, which can really give people more trust in the process, trust in the news media, which uh, as you probably already know, the news media could definitely use more of. And the last thing that is the sort of the more scary possibility is how to cover the possibility of uh, post-election civil unrest, given that it is very likely that the election outcome will be delayed. Um, and one of the things that we're really emphasizing is that the media be very careful about the sort of language they're using around different citizen organizations that may peacefully assemble um, after the election. Um, for example, one of the things that the media has got a lot of criticism for is referring to militia as militia rather than paramilitary organizations or domestic terrorism organizations. Um, and so that's one of the things we really like to emphasize. The other thing um, that is important is not to amplify claims that may help spread disinformation and uh, ferment racist ideas. And that's really difficult because again, uh, news media are driven by novelty. And these sorts of claims, these sorts of um, you know, uh, uh, disinformation can, and conspiracy theories can often be very novel and exciting and, and some might think worthy of covering. But it is dangerous in as much that it might, um, it might give more voice and more attention and allocate more media resources to organizations that are trying to take advantage of the media environment, trying to take advantage of the fact that it's really cheap to publish something on Twitter, publish something on Twitter, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's any sort of veracity behind the statement. So I want to kind of end with what 
normal people like you and I can do. Um, and the first thing that we can all consider is, again, the market is what drives news coverage. So if you see news coverage that you don't like, then don't watch it. Don't subscribe, don't click, don't like. Um, you know, you really kind of want to elevate news coverage that you like by retweeting it, by sharing it, by subscribing, right? By buying the actual uh, news product, which is sort of, you know, might blow the mind of many students who are not used to sort of reading the actual newspaper. Um, and, and, and not, you know, subscribing and not supporting the sort of coverage that you think is not worthy of democracy. The other thing we want to do is to think about really seriously about disinformation. And one of uh, the ways we can do that is we can, first of all, not share misinformation. Um, and many of you are digital natives already kind of are old hats at this, but some easy tips are um, if the photo looks bad, it probably is not from a great source. Oftentimes, legitimate media organizations will have, you know, photojournalists, and so the photos will be higher quality. Um, the other thing is if it comes from an online source to check the About Us page to make sure that it looks legitimate. Um, and uh, to do a reverse Google search on images, if it's an image, then you want to check the veracity of that. And also just to triangulate your sources, which is generally good practice no matter what you're doing. The other thing to know is that for many of you who are politically engaged or here with us today, you know a lot about what's going on, you're following it, but not everybody is. You know, your aunt, your grandma may be very nervous about voting during the pandemic, and understandably so, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of things that are new. And so one of the things that you can do um, as a sort of good citizen is make sure that your grandma knows what she should do when she's heading to the ballot box. Make sure that that aunt that keeps posting um, on Facebook about politics if, if she's posting something that is not credible, make sure she knows gently. Um, you know, help out people that may be feeling sort of overwhelmed by our current politics. And there's lots of really helpful guides out there to assist in doing this. There are many on the website that I shared with you earlier, in fact. Um, and as always, thank you all, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thanks guys. That's, that was tr a terrific uh, uh, overview. Let me start because I think it's a question on the view on the mind of a lot of our viewers. Um, what do we know about media bias? You know, conservatives for for years you now have been claim, claiming there's a liberal uh, bias in the media. Uh, so what do, what do the actual studies tell us about that bias? And you might say something in particular about the the current controversy over Hunter Biden and the unsubstantiated reports uh, about his activities. I'm not sure which one, which of you wants to take that. Well, I, I guess I can jump in. Um, you know, media bias. Uh, I, I think the first thing we need to do is not lump all media together, right? There are a lot of traditional news organizations that try to present just the facts. And in general, in the United States, they do a a pretty good job of that, try to, you know, give even amounts of coverage to the Republican and the Democratic nominee. And so the studies suggest they do a pretty good job. There are also partisan news organizations. A lot of them you'll find on cable television, for instance, or online. And, uh, you know, and that's not necessarily a bad thing if they're engaged in, say, fact-based analysis of the news. They have a point of view, they have a well-reasoned argument for that, it's based in the facts, go for it, right? Um, there's also those news organizations that are partisan shills um, that spread misinformation, disinformation. Uh, we should avoid those as much as possible, right? So I think it really depends on how you break apart those media organizations. Uh, with regard to this Hunter Biden kind of non-story. I think the mainstream media outlets have done a pretty good job of not magnifying that, of not turning it into a Hillary Clinton email story, because frankly, the facts just don't support that. There's no evidence that Joe Biden did anything wrong. And therefore, it's not really a story. Right. Yeah, Katie, let me ask you to, to comment on that as well. Um, 
you, what Travis says makes perfect sense. Not all media is the same. Some there are some that are more reliable, more balanced than others. Um, but uh, you know that's easy for experts to talk about. Uh, how do average viewers sort out what's a reliable source, what's not a reliable source, or a place to go for, for political information? Sure. Yeah, it's important to remember, um, as Travis notes, that you know I think in our minds, often as political observers, we're sort of envisioning uh, you know that lots of people are are just consuming rampant amounts of misinformation and or partisan news and you know, sort of worried about that, but uh, most people don't watch or consume the news. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, and, and, or most people don't actually come across misinformation that often, if ever, um, because they are not, you know, friends with, or they don't encounter politics in their feed very often. Um, but still just to kind of guard yourself, you know, the average person can think about consuming multiple news organizations, news outlets. That's always, you know, having multiple Full sources is always generally better. Um, if you don't have time for that, there's a lot of great organizations that sort of offer summaries, um, you know, or podcasts. That's a great way for people to get some sort of top of the line news. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, one thing that people can kind of be wary of is if something comes across their feed and they're not sure about whether or not it is um, a credible source, they can check out the website of, of that source. And, and generally, particularly our students have a really good sense of this because they grew up in this environment. They know when a website looks kind of off, but you can check that about us. Again, you can check the quality of the images. You can do a quick Google search on it. And typically you'll see right away if it's not a credible source. Um, and also it's, it bears uh, remembering that most people get their news from television and that's local television news. And that's a great place to tune in. And, and generally local television is gonna be where you hear about the sort of everyday politics that actually affects your life. And that is generally trustworthy. Okay, great. Uh, so Griffin Grubb asks a, a great question about the relationship between media and political polarization in the country right now. What does the research tell us about that? Does the media drive polarization? Does it reflect polarization? Uh, or, or, or do we know? Katie, you wanna take that? Sure. So um, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, this opinion actually might be unpopular. I, I'm interested in what Travis thinks as well. So um, one of the things I think that uh, you know, including scholars and myself in this, that we worry a lot about and that we hear these sentiments echoed in the media as polarization. Um, and one of the concerns I have as a scholar is um, that the, this term has been used to explain everything. Um, and it's often been overused in a way that it was not intended to, to be used, at least in terms of the methodology, in terms of uh, the precision of the conceptual term. And so uh, and why is that? Well, I think because people recognize that we're in sort of an extraordinary time in our politics. And so uh, they want an explanation for it because that's what people want. We all, we wanna be able to explain away uncertainty. And so the tendency is to grasp onto something and often polarization is used as the answer for everything. Um, and, and it is difficult as you know consumers of news to kind of piece out uh, reality from what we're seeing because as I talked about earlier, um, news outlets, journalists are, 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 are speaking with and talking to people about politics that are mostly engaged, right? The people that are watching the news that care about politics are often the people that are most attentive, whereas most of Americans are not attentive, right? About 20% of Americans are consuming politics, thinking about politics all the time. Those people look very different from the 80% of Americans that do not. And while journalists often cover these sort of voices because these are the people they hear from the most, but these voices are often the voices of the most extreme. And so I think it's really important for us as uh, you know, thoughtful observers of politics to remember that the voices we often hear from both in our networks on Facebook, on Twitter and in the news are the most attentive, the most politically extreme and the most politically engaged. And the everyday person on this, off the street um, is probably watching a lot more uh, ESPN and maybe a lot more, you know, E than the news and that they're not the sort of uh, raging partisan that we all kind of imagine in our minds. Okay, Travis, did you want to add anything to that? Um, maybe just a few things. I, I do think the media played a role in, in 
affective polarization or emotional reactions to the political parties, the fact that we, we hate the other political party now on average, right? Uh, not everyone. Um, but uh, again, I think it's important to kind of disaggregate the media, right? Um, if you're on social media and you're clicking on particular things and the algorithms makes it more likely that you see those things and then all of a sudden you're in this partisan echo chamber, right? And, and pretty soon you're in conspiracy theory land, right? That's much different from the individual who reads the local newspaper and maybe goes to the New York Times and maybe checks out the Wall Street Journal every once in a while. Um, so, so I think it really de does depend upon that individual's media habits, that individual's political knowledge. Um, as usual, the story is complicated. So, uh, so Ken Bird asked a question about uh, media's coverage of polls. We all know what happened in 2016. There were a lot of media organizations that made very, uh, very strong predictions about who would win and they were turned out to be wrong. Uh, and there's been a lot of efforts to recalibrate the polls and, and uh, how pollsters are, are operating. Uh, do you sense that there's a, a change in how the media is covering polls in this election cycle? Are they less hesitant to make predictions or to talk about aggregate polling? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So I think that it's important to remember that um, in 2016, the national polling firms actually did remarkably well. Uh, uh, they predicted the national uh, the popular vote, right? Correctly. Um, and it's very difficult, it turns out, to predict the Electoral College. It's a very different thing, right? Um, and so that's the first thing I kind of usually remind my students when we're talking about polls, because oftentimes the thing they say is, you know, what about 2016? Um, and, and so what we're, I think, in 2020, I think that there is reasonable concern about polling and coverage of polling, and that there's a lot of um, on the part of the public, but also the media, a lot of hesitation, uh, a, a tendency to be more conservative around this coverage. And, and just broadly, generally what we see and from my own research that I see is um, media love to cover polls because that's the sort of thing people like to consume. Um, and as we talked about earlier, they also like things that are novel and this translates to poll coverage as well. So oftentimes what we see in the aggregate that the, the sort of patterns are that media tend to pick the polls that are most exciting. And those are typically the polls in which there is a huge lead or they're very close. And so we see that there's more coverage of those sorts of polls than the sort of um, normal average run of the mill polls, right? Um, and so first just setting that sort of a baseline, what's happening in 2020? It's interesting because we kind of have the rise of the forecasters um, and we really saw them start to come to the fore in 2016, but uh, really, you know, people like Nate Silver have solidified their place in sort of the uh, politics in 2020. And uh, I think it's important to consider that forecasters also have incentives, um, especially like an organization that's sort of a hybrid news polling organization, forecasting organization like 538. Um, and you can see this in some of the methodology that Nate is using around this election. Um, they want to make sure that people find them credible. And after 2016, a lot of forecasters are a little bit gun shy, Nate Silver included. And so some of their modeling is far more conservative than it was last go around to sort of uh, make sure that they are uh, uh, being credible, that people are seeing them as credible. Um, and, and I think that that's an interesting development, but it's also reflective of a lot of the of media organizations kind of um, 2016 PTSD being more careful about election polling. And I think the people, you know, the public are also more considerate of polling and realizing that polling is not certainty, right? Uh, we have a hard time wrapping our brains around uncertainty and often numeracy is not very high in the American public. So it can be a really difficult thing to parse. Um, but I think people are, are, are making more of an effort to, uh, can, to wrap their brains around uncertainty, to kind of look at the methodology and to be more cautious in how they interpret polls. Okay. So Larry Clark asked a question about social media and recent efforts by social media companies like Facebook and Twitter and others to try to combat misinformation on their sites. Um, 
uh, A, are, are these efforts likely to be successful? And secondly, what do you think the impact will be on how people get their uh, information about elections and campaigns? Yeah, yeah. Good, great, great question. Um, you know, the, there are there have been several steps that they have taken. Twitter is making it a little more difficult to retweet something nowadays. Um, Facebook is making it more difficult to send a message out to a huge group, for instance. Um, campaigns cannot um, run, I guess, new political ads or newly created political ads on uh, Facebook starting from, I guess, yesterday. Um, Google is not allowing political advertising for some time after the election. So, and I think all of these steps probably make sense, though they could have some downsides. Uh, one of those downsides is that it doesn't allow a candidate to respond to a, a last minute charge made against him or her. Um, you know, and so the idea is to, I think, is to slow things down. Right. And so it gives the companies, it gives the news media, it gives the campaigns a chance to identify misinformation and time for those companies to take down that misinformation. So I think all in all, it's probably a good effort. I think there are going to be loopholes and not everything is going to be caught, though. What, what do you think about this charge? And we saw it today in the, the hearings taking place in Capitol Hill right now, uh, that Republicans are making that this is an effort to censor conservative views. I, I, I don't think there's any evidence of that. Uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives all, all use these social media platforms and uh, it doesn't affect one disproportionately to the other. Okay, uh, so uh, Malia uh, Lukitas has a really interesting question in, about social media as well. And she wonders uh, if its impact, one of its impacts might have been to uh, uh, leading to the nationalization of politics. We all know that, that um, you know, our campaigns at the local level used to be run on local issues, but increasingly they're run on national issues now or broad ideological uh, uh, appeals. And she wonders if part of that is the result of, of a social media. All we see on social media is coverage of sort of these national issues like Black Lives Matter protests or cli you know, climate change or things like that, and very little discussion about local issues. And so she wonders if that's one of the byproducts of uh, the import of uh, social media in our politics. Katie? That's a really interesting question. And um, Travis, jump in if you know of research that, that shows this definitively. I don't think that there is, that we know this for a fact. Um, we do know that the, um, you know, the so, sort of a collapse of the local news industry has contributed to the nationalization of our politics. Um, and in fact, whenever the uh, local news organization, we know whenever a local news organization closes in a community that we're more likely to see uh, that community reflect more national politics and in, in sort of surveys and public opinion. Um, and on top of that, because uh, newsrooms are, you know, trying to cut budgets wherever they can, they're less likely to be sending reporters out in the field and uh, they're more likely to be buying wires, you know, like having AP coverage. And so that also contributes to sort of nationalization of our politics. This idea of social media also being uh, playing a role is a really interesting one, but I don't think that we know that for a fact, but it, it makes a lot of intuitive sense that um, we hop on our Twitter feeds, we are in our sort of political bubbles, we're seeing a lot about the national races and not a lot about what's happening in town hall. Um, and, and another uh, way to consider this that we do have a lot of, of empirical research about is what that means for journalists. So journalists, just like many of us, are also in very political, attentive, engaged bubbles. Um, and in fact, we know that the sort of uh, bubbles they're in on Twitter is with a bunch of other journalists. Um, and that there are certain journalists in these bubbles that are really influential. Beltway reporters are one, uh, re reporters that the very large legacy outlets like the New York Times are others. And that among each other, they're retweeting and sharing and commenting on Twitter, um, that it's a very sort of close network. 
um, and that they're typically retweeting and liking and sharing work that is very similar to their own. Um, and that is very much national politics. You can imagine if you're a journalist, even if you're a local journalist, that you're seeing a lot of this coverage and sort of what's piquing your interest of the sort of what the, the um, top outlets, top reporters are talking about is national politics. That's sort of the thing that's also at the top of your mind too. Yeah. I'll add just one more thing. I do think social media has led to the nationalization of fundraising. Um, you'll see candidates like uh, Jamie Harrison running for Senate in South Carolina. Has, it's a $100 million campaign right now. I bet more of that money came from California than from the state of South Carolina. And I know they're running fundraising ads in, in every state in this country. Okay. Nicole Craze asks a question. She's, you know, she mentions that today, just this morning, the, the president again tweeted, that we no longer have freedom of the press in this country. Um, she asks, what can we do to restore uh, greater faith and confidence in our press and our media? Katie, you wanna take that? Since it's, you talked about the project you, <laughs> you're, a, you're a member of. Yeah, I love this question. It really gave me pause. Um, I think that it's, this is, this is, it's complicated. Um, even in, heading into the 2016 election, we saw um, a lot of distrust in the media. And this has been a trend that's been ongoing. Um, and so if we as a public are concerned about where this kind of positions us in the information environment, what this kind of means for the quality of information that's out there, and I think we should be, um, then I think what average people can do is to subscribe, you know, pay for the news product that you want to see, um, support the reporters that are doing the work that you care about, um, read your local newspapers. Um, and that seems so simple, but I think oftentimes, particularly because there's so much on Twitter, we forget um, that, you know, news isn't free, right? Um, I even find myself sometimes when I click on a tweet and it's paywalled, you know, ah, why is this paywalled? Why isn't everything free? But that news takes a lot of money to produce. And if we really want to see quality information, if we want to support journalists, we need to pay for the sort of news product that we like. Okay. Um, um, Nicole asked, asked a second question as well. Maybe I'll have uh, Travis respond to this. And that has to do with the, the, uh, recommendation on the website Media for Democracy to not cover um, inf misinformation or racist uh, um, appeals. And she wonders whether uh, it wouldn't be better to cover these, but just to frame them in the right way, to, to frame them in a way that explains why they're problematic or dangerous to democracy, rather than trying to ignore them outright. Yeah, another another great question. Um, you know, it, and that's that, that's the whole problem with with covering the president's Twitter feed, right? Uh, and journalists have been struggling with this for for at least five years now, uh, since before he was president, right? And and one of the decision rules that I think they've been trying to use is is this policy relevant, right? So if he picks a fight with a celebrity. That has no policy relevance at all. And that's something that should just be denied. Now, if it's the president inciting violence, well, that does seem to have some policy relevance, right? So it is finding the proper way to, to frame that. Um, and that's, that's something difficult to pull off. Um, but maybe starting the story, you know, believe uh, by stating there is misinformation going out about what's going on in Philadelphia. The, re the president is trying to play into this misinformation by suggesting this is a better way to frame the story than starting out with the president's call for people to take up arms or whatever he's going to say on Twitter. So uh, it's a good point. Okay. Katie, did you wanna add anything to that or? Sure. The, the other thing that I really like this concept of that Jay Rosen talks a lot about, uh, who's one of the signatories, is the truth sandwich. And, and it's a trying to solve this problem uh, that we see actually starting with ad watches back in the 90s, 
um, and earlier is that when you try to debunk something that's, uh, you know, an unfounded claim, oftentimes what we see happening is, well, people will remember the unfounded claim, but they won't remember the debunking. And so one of the things that um, Jay Rosen is really encouraging journalists to do is the truth sandwich, which is you start with the truth, you talk about the thing that's the unfounded claim, and then you end with the truth. And so if it's about mail-in ballots, you, you say mail-in ballots are safe. Here's all the reasons why. Here's the thing the president said. And again, mail-in ballots are safe, and here's all the reasons why. And, and hopefully that that can kind of really um, mitigate any uh, of the potential influential effects of the unfounded claim. Um, but again, we just this is such an unprecedented election. We don't know about how or if this will work and how influential it was. It is because, you know, research is slow. We're slow, right? So it's going to take us a couple of years to figure out whether or not um, this actually worked, but that's one of the sort of techniques that we are um, encouraging journalists to think about. Okay, I like I like that the truth sandwich, not to be confused with a nothing burger, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so Marcia Garrett asked a question. She likes the uh, all the recommendations that your working group has put together. Uh, she asked whether or not there's any indication that the media writ large is actually going to adhere to any of them. Uh, Katie. Sure, yeah, so um, we've had some really encouraging feedback and, and luckily we aren't the only people that are working in the space. There's a lot of really great organizations. Harkin is one of them, the Election SOS. There's a lot of great journalism or journalist organizations that are working on this. Um, but we have gotten really great feedback from journalists, um, including journalists at NBC and ABC um, uh, and, and elsewhere that they are reading this and thinking about this. And so that's really exciting. Okay. Travis, you want to add anything or? Okay. So uh, Joseph Heiler asked a question about major newspapers and he wonders whether or not there's some indication that they have become uh, partisan in, in their uh, coverage. And she, he cites as an example, the Washington Post's um, uh, logo that they've adopted, which is uh, the truth, uh, democracy dies in darkness. Um, do you think that this is a problem that some of our, our major newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, have come to be seen as, as partisan out, uh, outlets? Uh, great question. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think a couple of points I'll make on this. One, I think it's important to separate the editorial page from... Uh, all the reporters at the newspapers, certainly the editorial page of the Washington Post uh, leans left, right? If you read Jennifer Rubin, you know where she stands, right? Uh, even though she calls herself conservative, which I, anyway, um, and, and, and certainly the editorial page of the New York Times leans left. That doesn't mean that the stories on the front page have a democratic bias, right? Um, the other thing I would say is I'm, I'm not sure if there's a, a bias that's being shown by some of these news organizations. It's a bias in favor of democracy as opposed to authoritarianism. And so, um, and, th and that's a bias that I'm okay with them having. And I think most Americans would be, right? Um, now, nonetheless, there is a perception absolutely um, by a lot of people that these major news organizations, they're, you know, liberalized, whatever. You know, where does that perception come from? Um, it's not because your crazy uncle reads the New York Times, but because your crazy uncle is listening to politicians who are complaining about the New York Times being uh, leftist and biased uh, so that they don't have to respond to the actual facts that are contained within the New York Times. So it's the politicizing of the news that is leading to these perceptions that these news organizations are biased. When in fact, the actual news stories on the front page, um, I think are engaging in the truth. Okay, so as long as we're on newspapers, let me ask you about a, a local controversy we're having here in Spokane, the Spokesman Review. Uh, just this, this morning announced that they are going to no longer uh, do uh, endorsements in political races. 
And this comes after they endorsed Donald Trump uh, on Sunday in a, um, uh, an endorsement editorial that many people considered just <laughs> poorly argued and poor, poorly reasoned. And there was a lot of blowback. So, so what do you think about uh, newspaper endorsements? Are they, are they useful? Are they something we should continue? More and more newspapers seem to be going away from them. What do you think? Travis, you want to take that first or? Um, sure. You know, I, I think it depends on the office. I think in the race for president, we, we probably have enough information about the candidates that we don't need the spokesman reviews point of view to help us make up our mind, right? Um, if it's a race for a local judge whom we've never heard of before, then having the expertise of that news organization uh, could actually be helpful. Um, and so, you know, I, I really do think local newspapers need to be focusing more on the local, right? That's where we have that dearth of coverage. That's where they can be more helpful, not more coverage of Donald Trump or Joseph Biden, right? And so if they want to make endorsements in local races, I think that could be useful, could have an impact in a presidential race. It's not going to matter. Okay, Katie, do you want to add anything to that or? Okay, so I'm afraid, I'm, I'm afraid our time is about up. Um, before I thank our guests, let me remind you that uh, two, next Tuesday is election day, of course, and hopefully you've, you've uh, voted already, or if not, you have plans to vote. We will be back again uh, with this series on the 2020 election on November 10th. We have a panel uh, that will conduct a post-election analysis for us. That includes Alan Abramowitz from Emory University, David Brady from Stanford University, and Keena Lipsitz from the City University of New York. It's a terrific panel. So I really encourage you to put that on your calendar. Now, also, uh, I want you to know that tomorrow we are starting a new series uh, that looks at race and um, the American criminal justice system. Our first event in that series will be at noon tomorrow. We'll, we'll be hosting uh, Shaniqua Davis from City University of New York and Bahia Muhammad from Howard University. And they're gonna be talking about the impact of incarceration on black uh, families. So I encourage you to tune in for that, to that as well. Let me remind you again, if you want any information about these events or any of our uh, other programs or events at the Foley Institute, you can like us on Facebook or go to our website, foley.wsu.edu. And now uh, I wanna thank our guests. This has been a terrific conversation about the role of the media in the election. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Cornell. Hope to see you all uh, tomorrow at our event and, uh, oh, and then next uh, on November 10th as well. Thanks again.